So the next session is on cultural competency to support the integration of refugees in our community. And I'm very pleased to be introducing the facilitators and presenters for this session. Um, Darcy Lacey from Pillar Nonprofit Network, Katie Boychuk from the United Way London and Middlesex, and Michael Minoki from Seeds of Change Project. Just to save a few minutes, um, they'll introduce themselves in a bit more detail as they come up to get started. So Katie, I believe you are starting off. Over to you. So my name is Katie Boychuk, um, previous staff at the London Cross Cultural Learner Centre in the capacity of Intercultural Education Specialist, um, where much of my role to this presentation stems from. I recently was lucky to have an opportunity to move to United Way um, as a community planning specialist and will be working with their community partnerships and investments department. Um, but I've been in, involved with community capacity building in the city for some time and cultural competency um, and intercultural competency uh, training for the last two years. So I bring that forward to the presentation today. Um, so I wanted to start with some information that sort of resonates with um, the talks that were, were presented to you this morning. Um, and in your package, there's a beautiful infographic that was designed by our very own Michaela Minoki, who will be um, speaking in this presentation. And we're not gonna go through uh, the infographic with you, but it's important to kind of look at this um, picture of information and understand where is it that people um, are leaving and coming from, uh, coming into Canada, coming into London. And over the course of the time that we saw Syrian refugees arriving here in Canada, You'll notice on the slide here that um, on average in London, we, we normally take in about 300 to 400 refugees annually. And this is just on average. And in the course of the time uh, between uh, early November until um, March end um, and, and coming into May, we saw over 900 Syrian refugees arriving in our city, which is more than double of the, of the annual number that we, we normally see in the city, so it's really um, uh, impressive to see that kind of number, and there was references to that in the earlier talks today. Um, so just wanting to bring some light to that, and of course, um, the GAR, which is Government Assisted Refugee, are those refugees that come as convention refugees, and as Tendai mentioned in her presentation, they are no longer refugees when they come here to Canada. As soon as they reach the Canadian border, they obtain permanent resident status, um, and are here as permanent residents in Canada. Private sponsored refugees as well, or the PSR, um, would be those that come in through private sponsorship holders. And um, they also go through the similar system, but don't have the same access of services um, that government assisted refugees would have. But it's important as you look through your infographic and do take some time to read through that today um, to kind of get a sense of these numbers and how um, exceptional this wave of refugees coming in from November until recent um, compares to that national. And if I could have the next slide, please, Michaela. So we're gonna just show a little bit of, of, for your understanding, and many of you working in this field would know this, but some of you that come to this event are here to learn uh, sort of beyond your role and capacity in the community. So we just wanted to shed some light on understanding this initial settlement process. Um, for government-assisted refugees, they are identified internationally as asylum seekers by the Geneva Convention definition 1951, which was established, um, to focus on internationally what is a refugee, who is a refugee, rather, um, an asylum seeker. And so government-assisted refugees, as well as private-sponsored refugees, go through this settlement process. The identification, selection, pre-departure assistance, and travel are all things that sort of come together and happen overseas. Um, it's, it's that reception and integration period um, where organizations like the Cross-Cultural Learner Center come into play, uh, South London Neighborhood Resource Center, or LUSO as well. Um, and for private sponsoring groups, it's the uh, private sponsor holder um, that will sort of kick in those supports. So that identification, settlement, and pre-departure assistance, again, is happening overseas where the family gets identified, um, their age, their name, where they were born, um, any kind of demographical information. The selection pertains to where it is they'll be chosen to go. And remember that refugees don't choose where they go. Um, the selection happens for them. 
and the pre-departure assistance um, involves some information that they will receive about the country in which they've been granted uh, to go to. And travel, of course, they will board the plane and be on their way. So that reception and integration piece is really where London has, has a key um, role to play. Um, regardless of government-assisted or private-sponsored refugees, they go through a, a process of understanding, again, Canadian law. Um, they'll have some integration knowledge around um, their OHIP and SIN number. Um, housing and settlement is a part of that. And then, of course, their primary care, um, which would also include mental health needs as well. So organizations like Cross-Cultural Learner Centre would focus more on that government-assisted refugee um, that comes to Canada and other private sponsoring groups would be responsible for the same aspects of integration as large organizations like cross-cultural would be involved with. So care, housing and settlement assistance support happens during that duration of the sponsorship time and normally the sponsorship time is only for 12 months. So 12 months for that family or individual. Unless there's exceptional circumstances where maybe an extension might be granted of that sponsorship time. Um, an example of that may be if there are um, extreme health care concerns with the family or if there's some type of disability that needs uh, further attention, then the sponsorship time will go past that 12 months. But initially, um, government funds that support a family or private sponsored funds that support a family are only um, brought forward for that initial 12 month period. And there's, there's three main criteria that are used to help select um, where, where refugees will settle. So family links is considered. If people are sent to London, it could be because they have a cousin here, an uncle, or maybe are reuniting with their immediate family. Community capacity is considered as well. So London is a great example of that, where we have three strong settlement agencies. Cross-Cultural Learner Centre in particular received additional funding to support more Syrian refugees coming to our city. Um, and community capacity also includes things like the Syrian Canadian Council, um, other, other cultural groups, um, different cultural festivals, um, and, and understanding of cultural competency within organizations that can support. And then finally, they look at also if there's exceptional needs or special needs in a family um, that can be supported in a city center. So in London, an example that I like to use is the London Health Sciences Center or network of hospitals. Um, we have a really excellent cancer program. And so if there are refugees that come to, to Canada and are sent to London, it could be because someone in that family requires some support um, through, through cancer programs. So that would be a reason why they may come to London. Um, so it's important for us to understand this information in terms of context, uh, getting a sense of really just kind of a brief overview of that selection process and criteria, uh, but also understanding that settlement agencies or private sponsoring groups are solely responsible for financially supporting care, um, settlement and integration needs for that initial 12 month period. And then again, if you'd like to look at some more statistics, they're in your handout in that nice infographic. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna pass it along now to Darshi, who will um, talk a little bit about how we fit within this model and, and understanding some culture. Good, mo good morning, my name is Darshi Lacey. I'm the Diversity and Governance Program Manager at Pillar Nonprofit Network. I also have the pleasure of sitting on the planning committee uh, for this event today. So as I get us talking about culture, it really is true for those of us who are immigrants to remember one of the core things is never be late for a meeting. I was late for the first meeting of the planning committee and by the time I joined the meeting, I realized that I was part of, included in the program. So, <laughs> so as a cultural note to get you started, this is something to remember. Uh, so, this workshop is on cultural competency, so to get us talking a little bit around what is culture, and it's really difficult to actually do table work with a crowd this size, but we're going to try. So we're going to give you five to seven minutes at your table to have a little bit of a discussion around, uh, come up with some examples and share your own cultural background, interest, and history. So this is you. Uh, what would you say when you're looking at your culture? The culture, for the, in, the, in this case for me, would be the culture of Dashi. What is my background? What is my history? Uh, and then have another three-minute conversation on what would be some cultural items from Canadian society in general. Okay? So have that conversation and then we'll sort of facilitate that in terms of 
uh, how you begin to develop some core competencies as you integrate. Okay, so I will stay back here. So if we could have, just by, you know, if you can just put your hand up and then maybe just shout out, maybe from, let me start at this table. So just, just in terms of, um, you know, the, the iceberg, you know, most people, we use this iceberg analogy on so many different things. So we've talked about things like religion and, and a sense of community, hockey, um, those kinds of things. So when, when you're coming into a community, those are things you can learn. You can learn, for instance, that this is the religion of this country primarily and know a little bit about it. You can sort of, it doesn't take very long as an immigrant, I can tell you it didn't take me very long be, to realize how important hockey seemed to be. Uh, so you can, if you wish, you could learn how, you know, whatever those rules are, you can figure it out if you watch a game or two. Um, people didn't talk, you talked a little bit about traditions, again, you can learn about that. The other thing that's on the tip of the iceberg, generally that most people really like, and love are the things that are related to sort of food and dance and music. These are things that we celebrate all summer long and uh, tip of the iceberg things that are generally uh, very easy to, to be part of. And then you have uh, the stuff that's below the iceberg. So these are the things that you have to start learning about a culture that is not that obvious. When you show up, there are so many unwritten rules and unwritten systems that if you're part of the system, you know what's happening. But if you're not part of the system, it takes a lot longer uh, to get to. So that's my segue to invite my colleague, uh, Michaela uh, Minoshi to come up and sort of talk a little bit about what that experience is like when someone is coming into our community and trying to sort of get integrated. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you, everyone. So I have to tell something about me. I was born in Italy in 1917. That day, the weather was sunny and... Okay. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm here because I am co-coordinating, together with Fatmata Tarawale, the Seeds of Change project. Uh, that is a community-based project that was born in 2011 in order to help people like you that work with immigrant and refugees struggling with mental health and addiction issues and we are finalizing our training material. You will find our table uh, over there. Um, I have, I am also a lot of other things. It's difficult to, to say something about you uh, in three minutes. I am still temporary here. I arrived from Italy uh, almost three years ago. I'm trying to become permanent residency. The system trying to keep me out, but it's something that we can discuss after. Uh, so let's start with the, the, the basic situation. Let's start to say uh, something about what happens when a newcomer, please slide, thank you, have to enter the Canadian society. So this is the most superficial description. You have a newcomer that enter or will enter the Canadian society. And someone of you could tell me, ah, yeah, but this is too superficial. Actually, there is some complex, some, 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 something that's going on in the Canadian society. It's not just that. You're right, but the problem, the point is that already, if this is very, very superficial, you have part of the system and part of the people here that think about just this level, and that's it. The superficial level of the iceberg. A newcomer arrives and she or he will be able to integrate in this beautiful society. We will help him or her and that's it. At the bureaucratic level, if you receive a label like refugee, you will receive accordingly a series of services. If you are an uh, um, economic migrant, you will have another experience. If you are a temporary 
um, um, migrant or an undocumented migrant, you will live another completely different experience. So this, what does it mean? That the labeling processes, the way in which we call, we named staff and person, affect a lot the personal experience of each of us or of each of the person that have to go through this, this um, process. But what happens? That we don't meet only the Canadian society, like at the border, hi, how are you? I am Canadian society, welcome. No, we meet individuals, officers, lawyers, uh, settlement workers, friends, maybe, no? So what happens? That when we meet individuals, we meet someone that maybe is absolutely comfortable in the Canadian society, but also each of us and each of you is unique. So in some way, we know that hockey is a Canadian staff, but we know also that, nobody, uh, that there are people, few, that don't like hockey. <laughs> I love hockey, okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know the name of the team, but I... Uh, <laughs> so, we don't meet only the complexity of the society. We meet individuals. We meet singular persons that have to deal with us, and we have to deal with them. Hmm? Please, lights. Thank you, Caddy. I train her. Uh, we don't meet only individuals. We meet also communities, like, for example, ethnic communities, neighborhood. No? The place in which we will settle is very, very important for our integration. If we will settle in a good neighborhood, what does it mean good neighborhood for us? With a lot of people from our country, with a lot of Canadians so we are able to have Canadian friends and, 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 and understand better the culture, what does it mean? It happened. And we have to discuss about that. And also here you see, no, come and also here you see part of the communities has a strong relation with the mainstream society, but maybe there is something that is out of the society. There is something that um, could be in a, in, a, in a contradiction. So what happens here? That if you think about the ethnic community, when I arrived here, some people tell me, ah, you're from Italy, you have to meet the Italian community. Why? which is the possibility that I am more close to a 70 years uh, old guy from Italy that arrived here in, the, no, maybe in the 15 and uh, is retiring and uh, maybe don't speak Italian because you think that they speak dialect and maybe it's, uh, um, I don't know, completely different from me than from Katie, for example, um, that maybe have my similar uh, educational degree, my similar interests or something like that. Why I should be addressed immediately to the Italian community? Which are the assumptions that you make when you address someone immediately to the ethnic community? Ah, you are Italian. Okay, this is your cage. <laughs> Bring it, put it in your community and shut up. Okay, thank you guys, you are very friendly. Okay, then you have another complaint. I'm joking. I'm teasing. We have another uh, a point. This is the organizations. There is also organization in the society. I ask Amwa how I can pronounce organization or organization. Doesn't matter here. Okay, perfect. So I pronounce organization here for you. The organization, you have to think about three different kinds of organizations. The institutional organizations, because refugees meet the institutions, first of all, before to arrive in Canada, during the selection, uh, process. You have to think companies, so private organizations, because refugees need to find a job. So there is complexity there. The, your English level, your experience, your uh, degree. And there are also the non-for-profit organizations, organizations like CCLC, Luso, South London Center, thank you, that help you in the first period, in the second stage of your integration path, but still, each organization has his own complexity. Turnover, funders that cut or improve the funds, program that uh, have to be developed or instead delete. So what happens? That when a newcomer enter in a society, thank you, even the other, there are, perfect, there are a series of areas of interactions, okay? The newcomer still is unique, still have his or her own 
characteristics, but during the interaction with individuals, communities, organizations, and generally speaking, Canadian society, something changed in both sides. So the awareness about this process means that we can work better on the integration of the refugees, thinking that we all together and each of us have to play a role. Which are the role and which are the, the challenges that affect the situation? I know, sorry, what happens when a, a newcomer became a multitude, newcomers with the S? Happens that we have different dimensions with, the, with different colors, with different shapes. So you have different things and each of them is unique and still um, similar to other people that you are welcoming. So the, 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 the um, trade-off is to understand how much you can use the common elements that you can uh, find in a community in order to help the integration of that community and how much that person is unique and you have to tailor and the case managers know very well this stuff you have to tailor the services on the unique characteristics of that person so just to summarize there are three different challenges during this integration uh, path the first is related with the change in the personal ties and the needs to reconstruct sometimes from zero the social network here i want to talk about you about the informal network what does it mean let's think about this stuff if you have friends in your own country is canada or another country your friends are able to talk about you to someone else oh michele is like this this and that uh, he prefers this, this, and that. When he eats, he prefers everything. When, uh, no, this is uh, her, prefer I don't know, his or her characteristics. So your friends, your close people are able to talk about you, maybe with assumptions, maybe uh, missing something, but they are able to picture you to another person. What happened when you arrive in Canada? Nobody can tell about you to someone else. You have to restart from scratch in describing yourself. And in the first six months, you have to do this a hundred times per day. You have to restart to tell, I am from, this is my background. You, have, you start to know better yourself because you n never do this before, okay? You, are, you have to uh, answer these kind of questions because you are the novelty, you are new, the newcomer. So this is a process that could be very, very difficult for a lot of people. For people without any difficulties in his past, can you imagine for refugees how could be difficult this kind of process and this kind of? The second challenge situation is related to the socio-economic system. Again, you are an engineer, you are a, psycholo uh, a psychologist, you are an architect, you are a lawyer in your own country. What are you here? A volunteer. Because your degree some of your expect, um, experiences, some of your degree are not immediately, automatically recognized by the system. So you have to go through a very long process. I'm not judging that this is right or wrong, but this is a fact. So you have to go through a very long, long process in order to be recognized. And you know what? The Anglo-Saxon system is different from other systems around the world. So maybe in your own country, you were able to achieve the maximum level possible in your uh, pro professional. And here, if you go through years and years of acknowledgement and formal recognition, you will be able to achieve the minimum level of that professional. Or you have to keep another PhD here. And maybe you have already your PhD and your master and your specialization school in Italy or somewhere else. Hmm? So this is very important. The formal recognition is one of another big challenge. The third one 
is the shift from a cultural system to another. Uh, when we talk about culture, uh, it's challenging because we don't know actually what does it mean culture, no? We can joke about that, we can say, yeah, Canadian culture is this and that, Italian culture is mafia, mandolino, pizza, spaghetti. <laughs> it is, but maybe it's other some, some, some stuff, no? So you change from another, fr you move from a cultural system to another one. What does it mean? I want just to tell you something about the power dynamic. When you meet someone for the first time, it's normal, you start to profiling the other person. This is a good person or he will try to kill me. This is normal in our brain, in our history, like a human being. We need to understand immediately who he is the person that we have in front of us. Perfect, but during this profiling process, we create a series of labels based on our assumption. So, it's very, very, very important to understand that the assumptions that we have, the biases that eventually we have, define and affect the way in which we picture the person that we have in front of us. And you can say, yeah, but this is a peer-to-peer -peer relation because in the same time I'm picturing you, you are um, um, picturing me, so it's something that we are doing in a mutual situation and it's okay. Yes, but who has the power of the language? which is the language that we have to use in order to profile each other. Where we are, we are in Canada, your home. So which are the rules? Which are the rules of the play, of the game here? I have to learn that. You know that. You have a common background with all the other Canadian guys that I not share with you. So I have to do a, a double or maybe three times, four times the effort in order to do that. So when we, as um, Peggy said before, when we invite someone to dance, that is a very good metaphor for the integration, the problem is that first the person has to understand the rules, how you dance, because in Italy we dance differently. Okay, and I don't want to step on your foot. So just to conclude, the last is this, that for sure there are challenges, for sure there are weakness, problems. Refugees have a lot of um, things that they have to go through, but we cannot think only in a negative way because fortunately there is resilience. Resilience is a word that was already uh, used this morning and basically resilience is our ability to struggle and to cope with the difficulties that we have to, to, to meet during our uh, life, our daily uh, life. So the point here is that fortunately there are some characteristics of the resilience that we can bring with us where we go. And the refugees for sure have resilience because they already went through situation that thanks God I had not to go through and maybe the majority uh, here. And they were able to survive and they were able to reach Canada. So it means that Resilience is something that is already there. What we can do to understand, without changing a lot in our organizations, in our daily activity, each of us could think about where I can work in order to support the resilience. Because, for example, some people here, some decision maker, can work about social justice. And it's just a piece of the network that support the resilience, but is a good piece. So if they do something about the improvement of the social justice, mean that indirectly they are supporting the resilience of refugees. And this is very important. So now, I guess I have to pass the word to Darshi. So Michele walked us through an amazing process. I, I love those slides. The first time he showed them to me, I started saying, okay, I'm going to actually start poaching them for other work that I do. Uh, because it sort of walked us through a, uh, sort of a journey of how, what happens, right, when somebody comes in and how they're trying to understand the system. So now I, I want us to sort of begin to have a conversation about, so, so what do we do, right? How do we put our intercultural competency um, lens on things because 
how we frame uh, in rela relationship to other people is within the context of our own culture, whatever that might be. So you, we started a conversation a little bit and you went to, you know, more into Canadians are kind. So if I was an immigrant and the only thing I knew, for example, that Canadians were kind, and this particular Canadian was perhaps not so kind, then you have something that's happening, right? So the only thing you can control to some extent is where your frame is. So to get us sort of thinking about that sort of thing about where our cultural orientation is, we have another little table activity for you to do, which hopefully will be fun, but learning. So remember, uh, can you put that up, Katie? Thanks. So we want you to put two lenses on this. So one is to look at it is uh, among these types of uh, questions, like not making eye contact, what it means to me, but just as importantly, to have a conversation of what it could mean to somebody else, right? So you're looking at from your cultural frame, what it means to me, but maybe what could it possibly mean to somebody else, okay? So have a little bit of fun with that, again, about five to seven minutes of a conversation at your tables, and then we'll gather back and share. So maybe we can start at the back of the room and, uh, and get a sense of some of your conversation. So not making eye contact and... Politeness, yeah. So remembering that, you know, so again, it could mean so many things, right? To some one person, it might be I'm not making eye contact is a sign of respect. To somebody else, it's what are they hiding from me? So let's look at the other one. Um, saying or gesturing yes. If they're saying yes continuously, they're saying that you, sh you should shut up or wrap it up, yeah. <laughs> See, it's lovely. There's so many cultures within this room in terms of how you're interpreting that, right? Somebody else? They understand what you're saying, yeah. Vicky? Encouragement? Yeah. Anybody else? One last comment around? Agreement? Okay. I'm following what you're saying, yeah. And then so because there's also times when to go to your point about saying, you know, I want someone to wrap it up, right? It's, it might be that I'm just saying yes, but I don't necessarily, I, I'm saying yes as a form of politeness, right? So I'm, I'm actually only getting, because what are the first few language, words you learn when you learn ESL? Yes, no. <laughs> you know, where the washroom, those kinds of things. So yes, you know, it's an agreement thing, and so it can become a politeness thing. Right. Silent or long pauses? Ignoring, yeah. I don't agree, yeah. Pardon? There's nothing to talk about. Reflecting on what's being said. That's right. They're translating from the original language to English and then probably translating it back so that they can, yeah. And some people hate silence, right? So if you are some, like someone who tends to sort of fill in that gap and the other person is needing actually for you to stop so that they can reflect, you can imagine what happens in that interaction, right? Uh, finally, arriving late. This is my personal favorite. Um, Michaela. <laughs> it's normal, okay. So, I, I mean, I have a little story to say about this. So, I was born and raised in Sri Lanka, and in the 70s, we had a lot of rationing. We had a socialist government at the time and we didn't import anything so 
So with rationing, for the, anybody who's had that experience, comes long lineups. We call them queues in Sri Lanka. So you would stand in line, but if something came up and you left, you just left because you figured the person behind you then gets your spot in line. So you, t time sometimes got a bit more fluid because that was how we managed our lives. Everything was dependent on that. So sometimes I find in, you know, for, in terms of being late is that there are times when people, even in this community who might have had that experience, who sort of say, well, I didn't really think it was such a big deal because the next person for the next appointment will just take that and I'll just show up and take theirs, right? Where it's it not necessarily the way things operate here. So, so because we are in that frame of saying this is disrespectful, you ought to know when it is, and sometimes we are kind of punitive around that. So, next slide, please. So just to frame sort of the, this particular exercise is really in terms of looking at where your cultural orientation is, right? Because that's the thing that you can control, is where am I sitting in this? So there are six cultural orientations. I'm gonna go through some of them and throw one or two out. So if you look at a cultural orientation of self, so for example, if you're given a task, what is your first thought? Is your first thought, what do I need to get this job done? Or is your first thought, who do I know who can help me get this job done? It can be almost split down the middle where you sort of say, what do I need? Whereas somebody else, their, their cultural orientation is, who do I know who can help me? This doesn't mean that somebody's gonna do the job for you, it just means that your work, your orientation is you're going to work with somebody else. So if you were a supervisor, for instance, and you assigned a task to somebody, and then you found out that they had gone and tapped into other members of the team to support that piece of work, if your frame is, I gave you a task to do, and this person in from your frame is going to other people to get that task done, then there's something, you know, then you have two different cultural frames, right? So in terms of sort of cultural competency or intercultural competency, what we're trying to say is then you look and say, okay, this is what I would have done, but why, what might be the other person's frame rather than assuming something different, right? So let me give you another sort of example around, I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, let's look at, um, you know, communication. And this one is an easy one. So if you consider yourself a direct communicator, I tell it like it is, and somebody else may not be a direct communicator, so their solution is that they would, you know, throw enough words at you till you finally get what you're trying to tell them, rather than perhaps saying, no, I don't think we should do it that way, right? So if your frame is a direct communicator, and this is a really good one when you sort of practice it, I would encourage you to have this conversation in your own workplaces because a lot of us say we're direct communicators in this kind of circumstance, but we don't always practice it, right? Because power dynamics and all these kinds of things come into come into play. So if you, in terms of intercultural competence, however, so if you're looking at the fact that you would prefer that somebody tells you exactly what they need done, and the other person is the kind of person who will, you know, take a little while. It's just no right or wrong, as Michaela said earlier, it's just a different communication style. Then when something, in terms of cultural competency, when something is not working in that relationship, the only thing you can control is what am I expecting? I'm expecting a yes or no, and I'm not getting it. Why might I not be getting it? Because this individual might be communicating in a different way. So what you can adjust is sort of your own competence around how you manage that. Okay. So if you, you know, if you go through each of these um, cultural orientations, you'd kind of sort of see a way always to look at placing yourself in terms of where your cultural orientation is, and then looking at somebody else. We tend to, sometimes with cultural competency, we sort of try always to learn more and more and more about the other person. It's actually not, it might not be as simple, but it is much more efficient to look at learning about yourself, and then you know what your interaction is with that. So 
that's sort of a little sort of session on, on sort of cultural orientations. And now I'm going to turn it over to Katie to talk about some generalizations and assumptions. I hid my water here, so I just needed a quick drink. <laughs> so we, we've thrown a lot of uh, uh, information at you so far. We talked a bit about um, statistical information regarding refugees coming to Canada, coming to London, and the settlement process. We looked at understanding how um, the complexities of our society and different groups kind of interconnect and, and interact with each other. And then we tried to bring it back down to the self, um, understanding our culture and looking at how we interact with people. So it, it really nicely segues into how do we then question our assumptions? How do we look at generalizations and be careful not to let it go so far to become a stereotype? And, and maybe perhaps I'm giving the answer away a little bit, but if we go into the next slide, um, for those of you that can see the picture clearly, I just wanted to open up to the groom here and ask you, who is this? What do you see here? What's your impression with this person? What gender is he? How old do you think he might be? What's his role? Is he working? Is he not working? Does anybody have anything they want to shout out to the group? It looks like he's had a hard life. I heard something else here. A wise old man. Wise, yeah. Religious, perhaps, yeah. So there's some things that he's wearing that you might be able to see that sort of indicate he's religious or what, what type of religion he may be. Anything else? He looks sad. Okay, so he may be wise. He might have gone through a lot. He's a religious man. He could be sad. Anything else you see? Pardon me? Oh, yeah, so he might be... Yeah, he might have grown up in a country that's warm. There was something else over here. Maybe he's worried. Interesting. Anything else that you, you see in the photo that hasn't been said already? Okay. So he might be longing for something. So there's a lot of things that just in a short time, when we look at somebody, we, we initially come to make a decision. Who is this person? Um, how, how should I interact with him? And sometimes we make these types of assumptions or judgments, if you will, because we're trying to understand how to interact with the other person. Um, so a lot of the things that we use to describe this man sound kind of sad. So let's see really what, what are his, some of his characteristics. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so some of you may know this gentleman. He's been in the news um, a few years ago, and when this story came out, he was 101 years old, so quite, quite an older man. Um, at his 89th year, he started running and um, going all around the world to run marathons. And for, is anybody a runner in the room? And no? Nobody? A couple people. That's great. So for those of you that like to run recreationally or for sport, you would know how good it is to do a six and a quarter mile race in an hour and a half. That's pretty remarkable for someone who's 101 years old. Um, so here it's just kind of meant to show, you know, it's that, it's that don't judge a book by its cover type of a lesson here. We see certain things when we meet people. Um, and we need to make judgments. We need to make assumptions. It's a part of our bias. And our bias um, is based on the experiences that we have in life, and that helps us to make decisions. But how we pertain um, the perception, rather, of those biases, whether they fall towards the positive or the negative, um, essentially is because of experiences we've had. So if you know somebody in your lifetime who's an older person that has gone through a lot, maybe his uh, facial expression resonates with that for you. If you know someone in your uh, family or in your community that is very wise, who is older than you, when you see that image, that resonates for you. So we pull out these sort of generalized statements based on experiences that we have. And the generalized statements um, that rely on our bias that, that 
come from our experiences really help us to identify what is it, what is it that we know about an object or a person? How do we react to that person or thing? Um, and how should we interact with them? So ultimately, we rely on these generalizations and we make these assumptions and it helps us to move forward. It helps us to build relationships, to interact with others. But we have to be really careful that we don't take that generalized statement and move it so far that it becomes a stereotype. Stereotyping is when we assume a person or a thing has certain characteristics based on unfounded assumption. It signifies a gap or lack in understanding. We typically stereotype those whom we don't understand or about whom we have no knowledge of. So stereotypes can easily lead to prejudice, which can easily lead to discrimination. And when we generalize, again, it helps us to navigate. It helps us to put what we think we understand to, to perspective. But going too far to stereotype puts us in a dangerous place. And if you remember um, that nice slide that Michaeli spoke to, which shows how a newcomer connects with the individual community organization within society. Um, when we stereotype, it puts us in a dangerous place in which members of our society become limited to reaching true potential. They, they will face barriers um, that won't allow them to contribute their talents as an asset within that community. So someone even at my table was saying, you know, they were born in another province um, and came to Ontario. And although she didn't come here as a refugee, she felt she was experiencing a lot of those same kind of beginning of integration um, processes because the culture in, in where she was born in Quebec was very different from Ontario. So we go through a lot of these different circumstances. And in fact, someone even coming from Toronto to London may be considered a newcomer in their, in their lifetime. So it's important that we look at how is it that we see others and individuals in the community. Not everybody that looks and sounds the same is the same. But we have to be very careful that we don't allow media um, and movies, um, you know, and other messages that come at us to help us identify who, who people are if we don't know them from personal experience. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all situation. So, you know, when we ask people to think about Canadian culture, even those things that sit on the surface could be considered stereotypical. Um, you know, we like maple syrup, we like hockey, um, you know, we have a winter. <laughs> These are kinds of things that we tend to think of first, and not always from a negative perspective. Um, but when others look upon Canada, when others look upon Canadian culture, um, sometimes things are poked poked at in fun or, or, or looked down upon if it's not what they know, if it's not what resonates for them. So it's important that we need to be aware of cultural commonalities. Generalizations help us to understand other people, help us to acknowledge um, each other, and help us to put in perspective, how should I interact with this other person? And that's why it's so important to identify what are your cultural orientations? How, what, you know, how big is my personal bubble? And if somebody steps in that bubble, will it make me so uncomfortable that I can't interact with them successfully? But we need to draw distinctions across um, individuals and, and understand, again, when we talk about refugees, the resiliency and strength that they bring. They are an asset to Canada and to London, regardless of the fact that they chose to come here or not. Um, so it's really important for us to kind of see them as who they are as an individual and what they bring here in the community. I'm going to pass it back to Michaela, who's going to share with you um, some strategies and tools around what we can do to support successful integration of newcomers. My water is still here. We have three glasses. No, because the, I know that double dipping is a taboo. Double dipping here in Canada is a taboo. It's one of my first lessons at the party. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Nothing? Are you double dipping? Can you explain me? <laughs> and I learned. Okay. Uh, and I survived. Um, so, first, thank you, Katie. First um, suggestion. Talking about when you have to interact with someone that don't speak English as first language. 
first of all, I want to spend some minutes about this idea that a lot of um, institutions here has and around the world that it's possible to have a neutral translation from a language to another. Sometimes I talk with the interpreters or case manager that tell me, yeah, but you know what, when we go to a specific appointment, that person on the other side of the table ask us to translate word by word without change anything, so they are really sure that the message arrive. So, have you never uh, tried to use Google Translate? Huh? Put a, a sentence in your language and then English and translate it. Then put English here and retranslate in your origin language. You will start to laugh for a month. Okay? And the logic that the system asks us is the same that Google Translate use. Like, put together words that they think could, could seem some, uh, uh, have some significance. Actually, the translation is not possible in that way. It's always an interpretation. Why? Because the language is not neutral. The language is completely embedded in your cultural background. When you say double-double, uh, okie dokie. <laughs> and you think that someone can understand you, you are you. So how I can translate in Italian? That's the, I could translate double-double means doppio-doppio, double-double. Okie dokie, I cannot translate okie dokie. <laughs> so I'm stuck. We have to make another appointment. <laughs> So you laugh, but when you're having a situation with a medical appointment, a lawyer, and you have a poor English, no? So it's, it's, and you have to talk about sensitive stuff. No? You were raped. You were tortured. You went through terrific stuff. And now you have to say this kind of stuff to uh, strange people with a language that you don't understand, trusting a person that maybe you met f five minutes before, and that is the only occasion that you have in order to attain your permanent residency. So, the neutral translation is not possible because the language is contextual. The language is affected by the context in which you use it. And also moving from BC to here is exactly a good example because maybe for sure you, you understand everything, but you know that there are a series of expressions that maybe they used in BC and not here, and vice versa, and so you have to uh, deal with this. So, basically, keep it simple. Hmm? Make it easy. What does it mean? Use uh, the, the, the most direct and clear language possible. Sometimes, People tell me during the workshop, maybe uh, service providers, Canadian people, that to be uh, welcoming, they start to, to talk and they use maybe the daily English that they use with their kids or their friends in order to be welcoming and friendly. But when you start to speak so fast, it's very, very difficult to get your, uh, to understand what you are talking about. So maybe it's better to go slowly, non loudy we are not dumb, we are able to understand you. If you, uh, because if I start to uh, speak in Italian, e io inizio a parlare davvero in italiano, e vi dico che cosa sto dis discutendo con la mia lingua, probabilmente voi non capite più nulla, e io sto parlando troppo veloce per voi, giusto? <laughs> so, I said, basically, that if I switch in my mother tag, I start to speak very fast. When I typed uh, an email, uh, it happens recently, I was typing an email in English. <laughs> then I had to reply an email in Italian. And, and, and the person I said, but you are fast in typing. Yeah, I'm not stupid. <laughs> but you know, this is not my language, so I have to think the grammar construction. I have to think uh, and I have to think where are the letters, because you spoke in a way and write in another. So, no? <laughs> no, this is a joke. But, so, 
don't complicate what you have to say. Be direct and be clear. And this is a very good, good situation. In that situation, could happen. When you are more than one, you are in group, and you talk to each other, and you have an activity, if you are Canadian, and there is one guy, like if you have an advisory committee, all Canadian or almost, and you are the only one <laughs> that's not speaking English, the first meetings could be challenging, but after a while you get the way in which people communicate. So be mindful that sometimes you start to talk with the other Canadian people in a, in a way that is very normal for you, but maybe the other person could be put aside the conversation. So be mindful that there are maybe people around you that speak another language. Oh, about the gesture. We already talked about that in the previous activity. So gesture is a very powerful, powerful um, 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 channel and strategy to communicate. No, I can say, very happy today, very happy. Life is so good. Thank you, everyone. No? And my message is not clear, okay? But be careful, because sometimes your gesture means something else in the other culture. So maybe you want to be friendly, and you put your, uh, yourself on your chair, and then your feet in your desk. Oh, we are so relaxed. Let's talk about your life. Maybe you have a person over there that is offended by this, this gesture. So before, you, you cannot control everything. We are not telling that you have to understand all the culture around the world and control everything. It's impossible. But just question yourself. Question your routines. And question your gesture. And maybe ask. It is okay for you if I put my feet here. Maybe the person will answer yes. And yes means a no. But they don't want because of the power dynamic. If I need your support, you can do everything you like, almost, no? Because I am in a needy situation. But, but still, ask is a, is a good strategy. And then, these, some, these are just three um, short uh, suggestions. When you have a colloquium with someone else, these are very, very powerful. Repeat and rephrase are very, very powerful tool. Why? Because if you, when you repeat something that, is, uh, that someone else uh, told you, you not only help yourself in understanding if you understood, but you help also the other people in understanding if the results of his speech were, are exactly what he or she would like to tell you. And so the person can say, no, I didn't mean this. I have to re-explain you. And this is very useful in, during a conversation. And also the rephrase, I, for example, it's very beneficial with me when you rephrase my sentence in a good English because I'm learning, no? So sometimes maybe some people repeat or conclude one of my sentence because I'm in difficulty in, in, with the English. And that is very useful for me. And I love that. Someone else could be offended. Let me finish with my pace, with my English. I will try to explain myself. So it, it depends. It's OK for you if I help you in rephrase. It's OK. So you mean this? So it's very clear when you rephrase a sentence, it's useful because you help yourself and the other person in understanding the real result of the speech. Hmm? And uh, the last one is don't ask question that can be answered with a yes or a no. Agree? Someone knows this joke there because I used this joke before. Yes or not, don't tell you if the person is understanding or not. The only way to understand if the person is understanding is to ask him or her to narrative, to, to, to explain something. So, Use the, the classic what, where, when, why, and how. Or which is your opinion about that? What we can do together in order to go through this? Or uh, um, something that could help uh, people to talk and to tell, uh, and, and yeah, to communicate to you that they are following you and understanding properly you. So I guess now we have the last activity with Darshi. And that's it. Thank you.
Thanks, Michaela. So really my, my job is to wrap up, but I have a yes, no story to tell you. So Sri Lankans, when we say yes, we should go this way. And when you say no, you go this way. So there is a joke about our f finance minister going to Washington asking for money. And so the US government said, you know, we'll give you $10 million. And he goes, OK, OK, we'll give you 15. OK, 25 is our final offer. So it just depends on, you know, how you, how you do things. And the interesting thing about culture is that I know how I do it one way here, but my, my husband says that the moment I land in Sri Lanka, he says, you start doing this for, for no. So it just, it's so inherent in our culture as to how we communicate, right? So we've taken you on a bit of a journey today. So we, uh, you know, in terms of the intercultural competency, we sort of set the stage a little bit for you. We did some activity where you had hopefully some self-reflective moments as to how you, depending on your own context and culture, sort of contribute to it an understanding of what, um, you know, what it is like when people are coming into this community and understanding the different systems and how our system itself has changes every time uh, we have changed like that. So what we'd like you to do, sort of, you know, our form of a mini evaluation, there are sort of pink post-it notes, uh, not post-its, right? They're not sticky. They're pink pieces of paper, and we'd just like you to sort of do um, sort of a bit of a self-reflective or whatever you may have gotten out of this, this session, more from a perspective of what you might say you might take back to your workplace, your home, your day-to-day -day interaction, whether it's from, uh, you know, from a societal perspective, uh, within your own organization, in your community, or yourself. And you don't have to answer all of them, it's just whichever one you think you would find impactful in terms of what you learned today. Um, I'm joking with what Michaela said about Google Translate. I'm not sure how Google Translate would translate an aha moment, uh, but hopefully you, you had one today.